Amen. Thank you, worship team. Oh, it's good to see you all. How is everybody doing? Good. Yes. Good to see you all. Um, my name is Carl Johnson. I'm a pastor here. And I haven't been here in a while, so it's so good to be back and see all your faces. Yay. Yeah. Um, I don't have to tell you where I was. This is the, lo the day we're, we're living in today. And uh, I came back to... Um, came back to our office this week, and um, they're like, hey, Carl. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's what they call me. That's my name. I forgot little Lord of the Rings uh, quote there. But um, it's good to be here. Uh, David gave me this text to preach on. And two weeks ago, I call him on Sunday morning. I said, I can't come. I'm so sorry. I got symptoms. And he's like, I got you, bro. And so thank you, David. Preaching with one hour's notice. Come on. That's amazing. So... Give it up for your head pastor. We're so grateful. And, uh, but I'm, I'm grateful to finally uh, get this message out to you because I've been cooking on it for a while. So today we're in Matthew chapter 4. The title of my message is Tested in the Wilderness. Tested in the Wilderness. And I don't know if you know this, but before Jesus goes out uh, and does any public ministry, he gets shoved into the wilderness to be tested. And I don't know if you ever asked that question, like, why? Why does the Holy Spirit do that? We're going we're gonna to go here this morning. And I'm, my hope for you is that you will never see this text the same again. I used to just kind of read by this and be like, yeah, okay, he's God. Like, how hard is that? And let's move on. But friends, this, <laughs> this text is like an onion, and there are layers and layers and layers. So I hope that you'll appreciate some of the depths of this text after this morning, and I'll try and touch on a few of them. So let me pray, and we'll, we'll, we'll dive right in, and we'll get started. Father, we just, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you are stronger, that sin is broken, that it's written, that you're Lord of all, and you've rose from the grave. And we just, we love you this morning. We ask you to open our eyes, help us to see you in this text this morning. Amen. Amen. Now, if you see me sniffle a little bit, that's not any symptoms, okay? So don't be hating. I just, I get a little leaky when I preach. So this is all Holy Spirit. This is no, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm symptom free. Though, so just a disclaimer there. Let's get started. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights... He was hungry, and the tempter came and said to him, we'll stop right there. Okay, just have a few context things before we get started. Uh, four things I want you to know. First thing is, if you remember a few weeks ago, Jesus just had his baptism. It was this like dramatic wow moment. Do you remember that? Heavens are opened up, right? The Spirit of God descends and rests upon him. The Father speaks audibly for all to hear. This is my son. I'm so pleased. And it was just an incredible moment, this wow moment. But we go from the wow moment to the what? Wilderness. And uh, there's a little bit of a, uh, uh, a, a template for you and I. If we follow Jesus, we're going to have wow moments followed by what? kind of moments. Amen. Okay. There's our life is a series of testings. Okay. We learn about that in the book of James. And uh, if you're not going through a test right now, you, you just came out of one, didn't you? <laughs> or you're probably going to go into one. So we live in these cycles of being tested. And uh, Jesus is going to go through a cycle here. And you know, if you read some of the discipleship training manuals, they don't put wilderness in there a whole lot. I, 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 it's rare to find like how to, how to follow Jesus or how to teach someone to follow Jesus. Do you see, well, after someone trusts Christ, just let the Holy Spirit shove them into obscurity for 40 years like Moses and just be faithful in the mundane and being a nobody until God calls you. <laughs> or like Joseph, remember Joseph, he's shoved into uh, slavery and in prison for a long time, I think 13 years. But it's a template for followers of Christ to be thrown into the wilderness after these wow moments. And so uh, that's one thing you need to know is that Jesus just came out of an incredible wow moment. The second thing you need to know is that it says that the Holy Spirit led him to be tempted by the devil. This is, this is a paradox of scripture here. 
Uh, we're going to find out in Matthew chapter 6 that Jesus says, pray, lead me not into temptation. So, Holy Spirit, what are you doing lead, leading Jesus into temptation here? Well, we know, we know in Scripture that God doesn't tempt anyone, right? The enemy does. But God does lead us into testing seasons. We've got plenty of scriptural examples of that where God says, I did this to test you. And so God will use the enemy as a tool to test us, to prove our character. If we read uh, Luke chapter 4, it's a parallel of the same story. Luke, Dr. Luke writes the same thing in the same chapter 4. And he tells us that Jesus is tempted for 40 days. So don't uh, assume that Jesus is just kind of hanging out in the wilderness and waiting for the devil to show up at day 40. It's a whole season of testing. It is a whole 40 days of be being tempted, according to Luke. And so you need to know that, that what we have recorded here in Matthew chapter 4 is sort of like the final showdown, okay? So there's tempting all 40 days, and then finally you have this, this showdown between the enemy and Jesus. And... Uh, the other thing you need to know, third thing, a lot of context here, sorry, I told you there's a lot of layers, but um, he's been fasting for 40 days, and it says in the text here that he's hungry, verse 2, and now I've never been on a 40-day water fast before, I'm hoping that someday I'll get a chance to do that, although I might turn into Matthew McConaughey from the uh, Super Bowl commercial, if you ever saw that, he was, anybody see that commercial? The Doritos commercial was totally flat, anyways. He was just like thin, you know, he was just like paper thin. Um, but uh, I've, I've heard from folks who have gone on 40-day fast, and uh, it's kind of known that the, the hunger pains go after a few days. And they're gone for most of the time, but when the hunger pains come back, that means that your body's actually shutting down. It, you're actually starving to death. So we actually know from the text here that Jesus is beginning the dying process. His body's shutting down. The hunger pains have returned. So you just need to know that. And uh, he's totally alone. There's no disciple with him. So we know that he eventually told the disciples this story. And he told it for them because this is their story. And what I want you to see this morning is that this is your story. This is my story. Our life is going to be, we're going to experience this. And uh, it's basically going to be, you know, uh, the full brunt of what the world can offer. I, I don't know if this is like totally... This is kind of how I picture it. But in the, in the wilderness, Jesus is going to be uh, confronted with pretty much all that the world can throw at you. On the cross coming up, he's going to get all that hell can throw at you. But this is going to be a world test, okay, testings of all that the world can throw at you. I want to show uh, just 1 John 2.16 real quick. This is a great summary of what the world can throw at you. John summarizes it into three categories. So he says... For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but these are from the world. So John, John summarizes, this is, what, this is what Jesus is going to be confronted with. This is what you and I are going to be confronted with all our lives. Uh, the Bible calls craving for physical pleasure, they call that the lust of the flesh. Craving for everything we see is called the lust of the eyes. And pride in our uh, possessions and achievements is just called the pride of life. You'll see that in Scripture. And uh, that's what Jesus is going to be bombarded with. You know, outside of God's will, um, the lust of the flesh can be called hedonism or sensuality. It can be food. It can be entertainment, music, anything. It, it, these things aren't necessarily bad, but outside of God's will, it's hedonism. And... Um, the lust of the eyes is, is, is outside of God's will. It's, it's materialism. It's greed. And the pride of life is, is feeding the ego. All these things are what the world throws at us. And I want, you to just, I want you to know, don't assume that just because Jesus was God, that this was like a walk in the park for him. There's something I need to show you this morning that is so crucial to understanding this text. I don't want you to miss how difficult this was uh, for him. And uh, the ancient church fathers, they built this thing called Lent. David was talking about this. They, they built it into the yearly schedule so that Christians would understand that this is our walk through life, is resisting what the, what the enemy wants to throw at us. 
And so, um, in fact, I, th I read somewhere that uh, if you wanted to become a Christian in, in the early church days, they would say, all right, fast for 40 days before Easter and make sure that you, uh, that you actually want to you know, follow Jesus because it's not going to be easy. And then if they would do that, then they would baptize them on, on Easter. Kind of a cool thing. But wow, what a, what a thing, you know. Uh, but uh, this is going to be our life experience, friends, is we're going to have the world thrown at us. So let's take a look what happens to Jesus. Verse 3. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Uh, we're going to see that um, this small text has three versions of the enemy, the tempter, the devil, and the Satan. The tempter is not much of a, it's not a very popular uh, term for him, but it shows up here. Uh, it says that he, he comes to him. This is a real encounter with the spiritual being, okay? Jesus is interacting with, with the enemy himself. And this first test, okay, stones to bread. First test. Notice the, uh, the if there. If you are the Son of God. Remember, he already received this, right? He already, Jesus already received the, the identity from the Father just a couple of verses before. And here the enemy is confronting that. And there's some subtext to what he's saying. So it, it, there's, there's the obvious of like, hey, prove, right? Prove you're the Son of God. Prove to me or, or prove to yourself that you're the Son of God. There's a, there's a layer here that we can't go into, but... Jesus had to come to a self-realization of who he was at some point. So that's a, that's a mystery in itself. When did Jesus realize, you know, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm the Messiah. I'm the second person to the Trinity. He had to discover that at, at some point. That's a crazy mystery. But there's a sense of saying, hey, prove it. Prove this is who you are. Not only that, but there's this casting doubt on your circumstances, if you're the son of God, why are you dying of starvation? This doesn't make sense. What's going on here, Jesus? And, and there's another layer here of, hey, if you're, like, you're dying of starvation, son of God, do something. There's a temptation to do something. Like, change your circumstances. Fix it, son of God. Do you see that? There's all those undertones in this question. And this is what the enemy whispers to us. If you're a follower of Jesus, he'll say, if you're really a beloved child of God, if you're really his son and, or daughter, why are your circumstances so off? Like, why is, it, why is it so difficult for you right now? What's going on? Why, why are finances bad? Why is your health so bad? Why, why are you having difficulties? There's a casting doubt on who you are, isn't there? And there's a casting doubt on the Father's goodness in your life. The, the enemy wants us to doubt the Father's goodness based on our circumstances. And he wants us to do something about it outside of God's will. Fix it. Fix it in your flesh. Step outside of God's will and do something. Do you see that? This is definitely our, this is the, what the world throws at us. And Jesus is, ex is experiencing this very same thing. You know, the world will say to us, if you desire something, you're entitled to have it. Friends, that's like a, a lie. Just because you have a desire for something, you're not entitled, entitled to have it. And we're trying to train our kids in this. You know, my son will say, Dad, I want ice cream. Just because you want ice cream, son, doesn't mean you're entitled to have ice cream. It's, I mean, I like ice cream too. But that doesn't mean you get to have it all the time. we got to train our kids that they can't just have what they want all the time. Amen? But the world has gotten into insanity right now to where the world will say, it's not just that you're entitled to have something that you want. It's your identity. If you desire something, it's who you are. Friends, that couldn't be further from the truth because we are who God says we are. Amen? And so this is what we are confronted with. We are, we are confronted with our life is defined by our cravings. We're confronted to doubt the Father's love and goodness when circumstances are down. We are confronted to do something outside of God's will to fix our lives. This is an appeal to our cravings and, and, the, and our bodies. Now, there's an intentional contrast going on here. Just a little, another little layer I'm going to take off here. 
There was another person in Scripture who was tempted with food. You know who that is? Who was it? Adam. Adam, remember? Adam was tempted with food. But look at, look at the contrast that's going on here. Adam is in the garden. He's in luxury, fully satisfied, tempted with food. And what does he do? He falls. Here's Jesus, the Son of God. He's in the wilderness, starving to death. And he resists it. I mean, we got to see that, like, the world has never seen a man like this who's able to resist the temptations of the world. We need to see that Jesus is overcoming where all of humanity has fallen, you and I. So the test for Jesus is, is a shortcut. It's a shortcut to the Father's provision. All these tests are going to be shortcuts, and we need to see that. Jesus, use your divinity to satisfy a genuine need. Keep in mind, this is not like a lustful thing. This is not like, this is like, he's hungry. He, need, he needs food. Like, just make some bread, right? It's a legitimate need, but it's a trick. And I'm going to open up a little theological thing here because the text demands it. Um, but there is a principle going on here. And that, and that is this, that although Jesus was fully God, he lived in such a way that he didn't draw on his divinity. And that's revealed by this test. you got to see that. That's kind of what the enemy is trying to do. Do something in your divinity, Jesus. You're God. It's harmless. You're hungry. Just do it. And now we're going to take a look at John 5.19, which John uh, captures Jesus saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, you want to circle that in your Bibles because you're probably going to have a hard time believing this. Whenever Jesus says truly, truly, it's, you're gonna, it's going to be tough to believe this one. But truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing on his own accord. Nothing. Only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Okay, that's going to that's gonna reveal that to us. That although Jesus was fully God, he walked this earth as a man. Who was com he had to be completely dependent on the Father, and on the Holy Spirit. Which means, this is huge, he's enduring this as a man. You have to see that. He's enduring this as one of us, friends. Now, I, I, have, an, I have an analogy for you. We all know what laptops are. Imagine a laptop, okay? And a laptop can be powered by the battery or it can be powered by the power cord, Right? Now imagine the, the laptop is Jesus, and the, the battery is his divinity. He's God. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's the eternal God, and that battery is his eternal godness. Jesus lived in such a way that he never drew on the battery. He was always dependent on the power cord, okay? Always submitting himself to only what the Father is doing, and what the Holy Spirit's leading him to do. We have to see this, friends, or else we're going to just assume that Jesus was Superman. And we're not going to realize that, like, he's our model, friends. He lived the life to show us who we could become. That's crazy. I know it's a bit provocative, but you have to see it in this text. The, the, the text is showing it to us. Jesus lived in such a way to, to, to humble himself and live like us. Now, let me just show you Philippians 2, 7, amplified version little shout out to the Amplified. I love, I love the Amplified. This is going to unlock some of the theology here of Jesus, the man. But Jesus emptied himself without renouncing or diminishing his deity, never stopped being God, but only temporarily giving up the outward expression of divine equality and his rightful dignity by assuming the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of a man, man of men. He became completely human but was without sin, being fully God and fully man. Love that. Jesus actually chose to endure fully dependent on the Father. This is why he can't just make stones to bread. He can't just like snap a finger and do what he wants. He's like, Father, are we doing bread right now? No, son, we're not doing bread right now. That's coming later, but not right now. Father, I'm, I'm starving to death. You know that? Like I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to do a ministry here. I know, son, I know. Trust me. Friends, that's, our, that's what we are to do. Another thing, too, is if Jesus actually does this, if he actually, like, just uses his power, 
and just makes bread. Uh, he would actually disqualify himself from being our savior and our high priest. Another big theological concept we, I can't unpack at all, but I'm just giving you, I'm just wetting your palate on some of these huge layers being revealed by this text. And I'll just show you Hebrews 2.17. It says, therefore, it was essential that he had to be made like his brothers, like, like become a man in every respect so that he might by experience become the merciful and faithful high priest in things related to God to make atonement, propitiation for the people's sins, thereby wiping away the sins, satisfying divine justice and providing a way of reconciliation between God and mankind. Okay, I know it's like a big theological statement. Jesus has to be a man because a man has to pay for man's sins, not God. Man has to pay for man's sins and he becomes a man to take our punishment and live a perfect life for us. And he becomes our high priest in that way. This is so crazy. So in this text, we have to first marvel at the man Jesus Christ. Like he became a man. If he, I'm going to keep saying that this morning. He got hungry. He didn't just look like a man. He didn't just put on man flesh. He was a man. And he forever will be a man. That's crazy. The incarnation is like absolutely crazy. He will always be fully God, of course. But he put on humanity. Uh, one of my favorite professors and authors, Gordon Fee, said it like this. He said, Jesus was not Superman. You could have beat him at basketball. So he, he had to learn things. He had to, he, if he didn't learn basketball, he'd be bad at it. He was actually a man, and he was submitted to the Father and everything and to the Holy Spirit. And so you have to see that core test for Jesus is, hey, Jesus, just do something. You're God. So tricky, but it would immediately disqualify him. And so we just see the, the, uh, the nature of Jesus here. Take a look at verse 4 in our text. Jesus responds, it is written. I love that we sang that this morning. Good job, Abram. It is written. Great way to respond. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I love this. This is, I do not live by my cravings. I do not have to live by my desires. My life is not defined by my needs. Friends, your life is not defined by what, you, what comes up into your heart, whether it's of the Lord or not of the Lord. Anything outside of, of, of the will of God that you crave does not define you. It is not who you are. You are defined by the revelation of God, and you are defined by who he says you are. Isn't that amazing? This is what Jesus is saying. I'm not defined by my situation right now. I'm starving to death, but that doesn't define me. I live by the bread that comes from the mouth of God. It's just amazing, you guys. Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy. He's quoting Moses. He's quoting Moses talking to Israel. Another layer here. This, you know, Israel was tested for 40 years in the desert, and they failed. And uh, Jesus is quoting Moses' summary of their, their testing and saying, God puts you in the wilderness to test you, to teach you that you don't live by bread alone. And here Jesus is responding. This is a massive redo. And I think Matthew, who writes to Jewish uh, audiences, is saying, hey, Jesus not only is doing a redo for all of humanity, he's doing a redo for Israel. Jesus is the perfect picture of humanity, what we were always supposed to look like what Adam was supposed to look like, and what Israel was supposed to look like. It's a massive redo. So Jesus is the perfect, I, I just want to say, Jesus is the perfect revelation of the Father to us. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We look at his life, and that's what the Father's like. But we look at him, and we realize that's who we are becoming. And it's amazing. And so I have good news for you. There's one thing that you want to catch from this morning. The good news is that you can overcome temptation. You can you don't have to get stuck in a cycle of this is my struggle, this is hard. You can actually, you can actually overcome. You can, you can actually overcome the things that are in your life. Now, the Lord will take you to a new place where there'll be new, there'll be new tests. But you gotta, you got to overcome. And like you, we can't just stay in first grade. We, God, God wants us to graduate to the next level and to, to, to take on a new, a new place with God. And we'll talk about that 
a little bit later. But this, this first test reveals the humanity of Jesus and his courage to say no in the midst of pain and suffering. So let's move on to test number two. Verse five. Then the devil took him. There we go, another label for the enemy, slanderer, the devil, took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, there's that if again, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Okay, test number two. Test number two, it's, we, we've just cranked it up a notch. Now, when you read this, it's kind of hard to realize, like, wait, what's, is, is this really that hard? Like, Jesus, jump off a cliff. No. Like, how hard is that, right? But this is actually a harder test. And I'm going to show you. Um, the, the enemy transports him to Jerusalem. So Jesus was in the wilderness, and now he's in Jerusalem. This is something that happens to people in Scripture, and I've heard it happens to some folks as well today where they enter a visionary experience, and they're all of a sudden, they're taken somewhere else. God did that to Ezekiel. He did that to a few other people. I think Phil, uh, Philip did that in the New Testament. So he's being transported to the, to, the, um, to the top of the temple. And now the devil's quoting scripture. You see that? The enemy knows scripture really well, friends. Really well. So we need to not just know scripture really well, but we need to know how to handle it. Amen? We need to know the timing of Scripture and the when and the how. And Holy Spirit, what are you saying right now? That, that is so important. Don't just take what anybody says to you with the Scripture. Because, you know, I've heard people throw the most crazy things out. And they've got their Scriptures. We need to know the Scripture and how to handle it. So test number two is uh, jump from the temple. Or I was, I was talking to my kids about this a couple weeks ago. And they're like, you mean like bungee jumping with angels? Like, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, that's what it is. Why is this so tempting? What's going on here? Uh, I, I want to submit to you that this is a shortcut to the Father's plan for, for Jesus' life, okay? Uh, this isn't just any old cliff to jump off of. This is the temple. This is the center of Judaism. This, I believe, would be showing himself in a dramatic entrance as Messiah to the public. And I think that's what, it doesn't exactly say that there in the text, but I think it's implied. You know, this is what people are expecting of the Messiah. They're expecting Elijah. Remember Elijah? He's carried off by the chariots of fire, the angels. They're expecting for great Messiah King entering in on angels. Here I am, Messiah, to take over Rome and to save you. That's what they want. And so the enemy's like, you know what they want, Jesus. They want angel entrance. Give it to them. Give them to them. Do you see that? Give them the dramatic entrance. Jesus knows the Father's plan is the slow, painful, grassroots movement ahead of him. Suffering servant. Humble. The enemy's like, you can take it if you want it. Be the dramatic entrance that they want. And we need to see that, friends, because what the enemy is giving to him is saying, feed your ego. This is, this is the, this is the uh, pride of life, the temptation of all that the life cannot, the, the pride in your accomplishments. Just show them you're the Messiah. Do it. This is what we get confronted with in life as well. And he's, he's saying, like, the, the angels will catch you anyways, so you're good. You'll be protected, which I think is a trick. I don't think the angels are necessarily... We know in Scripture that angels sometimes get delayed. This very well could have killed D Jesus. But this is what we get uh, confronted with in our, in our lives. Feed your ego. Promote yourself. You know, we want the world to see us as intelligent, good-looking, spiritual. We want others to notice. We want to feed the ego. This is called people-pleasing. This is called fear of man. And, you know, it's our, our need to feel safe that can lead to that. And so the core test for Jesus is act outside the Father's will and the Holy Spirit's leading and establish yourself right now as Messiah to the people and shortcut that slow and painful process. Do you see that? I really think that's what this text is showing. 
Uh, Proverbs 29, 25 says something fascinating. It says, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be exalted or kept safe. I love that. Jesus is saying, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do the Father's way. Father, we doing bungee jumping? No, we're not. We got a different plan. Take a look at Jesus' response in Matthew 4, verse 7. He says, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. He's quoting Deuteronomy again. And this is what Israel did, friends, another little layer here. You remember Israel gets, they get come out of Egypt and go through the Red Sea, miracles, signs and wonders, and then they're in the desert and there's no water. And they're like, we're going to die. And they're like, God, what did you do? Moses, what are you, you're going to kill us. And they, they basically grumble, they get offended, and they start demanding God. They're like, God, you have to do something. You've got to, like, we, just take us back. We don't even want this anymore. And God called that testing him. You can't demand God to do something. Of course, God had a plan. He gave them water, miraculously. But it was their attitude that tested him, demanding that God shows up. And so... Uh, Jesus decides not to do the grand entrance. And we just see the humility of Jesus here. We need to see the humanity of Jesus, but we need to see the humility of Jesus. He just, he didn't demand worship, did he? He even kept himself hidden for a while. Don't tell anybody. He came for the least and the lost. He came as a humble, suffering servant. It's amazing. Let's see test number three. By the way, are we, are, we, are we okay with God's plan for our life? Are we okay with it looking just not as glorious as we thought? I think we can have lots of like fantasies of like what our life's going to really look like. Even in ministry, that we're going to have this incredible, powerful impact. It's, it's, it's great to want that. It's great to, to want to be great for God. But often God just has the humble path for us. To be a nobody, hidden, but to be noticed by him and to serve while no one's looking. Are we cool with that? We need to be okay with that. That's what Jesus is modeling for us. Let's look at the last test. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. So we got another, <laughs> taking him again somewhere. To a very high mountain and showing him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. This is probably not a physical location. Even in Mount Everest, you can't really see all the kingdoms. It's probably a spiritual realm that the enemy is taking him to. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. Now, you, when you read this, you think, okay, that's, that's an easy no. No one else wants to do that. But the, the New Testament word for worship is, is pros kuneo. I've, uh, this, is, this is a word that I look up a lot because it's... it's it's the, it's the main word for worship in the New Testament. But it just means to kiss the hand. It's an old, old thing that people used to do is they used to bow down and kiss the hand of a king. Genuflect is the word. And it's a way of giving honor and allegiance to someone. But it's just a simple act. Do you see what, what, what Satan's doing here? Jesus' destiny is to inherit the kingdoms. And the kingdoms belong to Satan right now. By the way, who gave it to, who's gave it to Satan? Same answer, Adam. Adam gave it to him, remember? The, Jesus, uh, the, the Father gave Adam and Eve authority and dominion over the world. And when they sinned, they gave it up to, uh, to uh, Satan. And Satan's saying, I have it, and you can have it. Satan doesn't really know the cross is coming. The scriptures say, if Satan knew that the cross was the secret rescue plan. He never would have killed Jesus. So Satan's like, I don't know what your plan is here, Jesus, but I know you're after the kingdoms, and I, I own them right now. And you know what? All you got to do is bend the knee and kiss my hand. That's it. I'll give it to you. And Jesus, Jesus knows he's got a long road of suffering ahead. And friends, I, I, if, he's a, if he's enduring this as a man, I can't tell you how easy this would have felt. Just get on the knee, kiss his hand, it's yours. That's it. And friends, this is our temptation. This is called the lust of the eyes. This is called, this is, the first temptation was a temptation of the body. Second was a temptation of the mind. This is a temptation of your very soul. 
What will you worship? What will you worship? It's the temptation of materialism. Wanting things. And we think, yeah, but just a little bit of cheating, just a little bit of cutting corners, just a little bit of lying makes it so much easier. And you can have what you want. And this is what the enemy is bombarding Jesus with. Just, to, just, just kiss my hand. And you got it. It's that easy. I think we need to understand how hard this was. And that we are confronted with this in our lives as well. We all, we all know that we have callings. We all know that God has purposes for our lives. And we can despair of those when those get delayed. Amen? You know that? When, when, when we just feel like God's promises are slow in our lives, and we realize it's a long and painful process, we can despair and we can be tempted to take the short way out. And that's what the heart of this test is. And I think some of us here can be like, you know, Lord, I know you've called me to be married, but like, will I ever be married? And I, or, or some of you, you you're, you're trying to have children and you're saying, Lord, are we ever going to get pregnant? Or will, I, will my lost loved one ever come to know the Lord? Will I ever experience wholeness and emotional wholeness or healing this side of heaven? How long, Lord? And we can be tempted to despair on the promises of God and, and the temptation to take shortcuts. And that's what this is. The core test for Jesus is, is uh, just shortcut it, Jesus. It's so much easier. Uh, I want to recommend a kid children's book to you. Props to the Bevins, Bevan family. I see you guys back there. You guys recommended this book to me like 10 years ago. Uh, can we put that up? It's called The Brave Young Knight. And then there's another one for girls called The, uh, the Princess and the Three Knights, I think. And I love these books. I, read, I just read these to my kids this week, this week and um, I recommend it to you. Um, it's a story about a young knight uh, who enters a competition hosted by the king. And there's all these competitions for young knights to, to test their courage. And in every of the tests, there's kind of a shortcut. There's a, there's a, you, can, you can cheat. And uh, all the, the knights cheat. They take the shortcuts, and they win. Except this guy, he doesn't cheat, and he loses every single test. And there's a wonderful turnaround at the end where... <laughs> I don't know if this, this gets, makes me emotional, but um, it was an intentional test to prove the, his character. And the king, I won't, I'm, you kind of probably know what happens, but, but the king just affirms him, like, you didn't cheat. You are the bravest knight. And it's a turn. And friends, this, this is like the test of life. The test of life for you and I is to lose at life. <laughs> We're tempted to want to win in the world's ways. But the Lord wants to say, you know what? It's not about getting all that the world can throw at you. God will give some of us great riches. God will give the, some of us great inf influence and authority. And that's awesome. But it, we have to be doing it God's way, right? It's about how we do it. It's about our character. And the Lord wants us to be proven and tested and I just, I love these kids' books because they just, they show us what, what true character is. Let's see Jesus' response here in verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. Take a look at that exclamation point. Jesus is getting emotional. I think this reveals how hard this might have actually been. This wasn't just an easy like, no. This was, No. I feel the temptation, but I will not do that. Jesus gets emotional like this with Peter when, when, he's, when Jesus finally says, hey, I'm going to the cross. I'm dying. And Peter's like, no, you can't. We love you. We're friends with you. Jesus, it was hard for Jesus. And he says, get behind me, Satan. You do not have the plans of God. We have to see the humanity here, guys. This was hard. And he says, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. He quotes Deuteronomy again and says, you shall not. By the way, um, I, I asked myself this question. Why is he, why is he quoting de only Deuteronomy? Why not? You know, I know there's like a, an Israel redo going on here. But I actually read through Deuteronomy with that question. Like, is there something here in this book? Why did Jesus only use that book? And I will say, although there's some things that don't apply to us today because they apply only to Israel, a lot of it applies to us today. But there's this one word 
that shows up everywhere, and it's the word shall. And I just love it because I've said this before, but the commands of God are promises. So, you know, if you do, don't want to follow God and you're a thief and you just have a problem with stealing and you read, you shall not steal, that condemns you. You're like, ah, oh, you are condemned. But if you are a follower of God, if you want to follow God, and you used to struggle with stealing, and sometimes that's tempting. And you read, you shall not steal. That's a promise. Trust in me, and I will help you not steal anymore. You shall not steal. Oh, man. And I, I felt like the Lord gave me this even this morning. Uh, I felt, like the, I felt like the Lord is saying uh, to our country, if you trust me, you shall not murder anymore. You will not be murderous. And I think about the 62 million babies. You know, and I don't want to get into a political argument. I just, it says in the word, you shall not murder. And my hope is that one day, our country will lead the world and say, we will not murder anymore. We shall not do this anymore. So, Just feel that. Jesus. Jesus, we just pray for our nation. Let's just pray for our nation real quick. We're not a perfect nation, Lord. We don't deserve mercy. We pray that you would forgive us, all of us, me, for we've all had a part to play in the sins of our nation. And we ask you to put the sins under the blood of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus over our very soil and that you would revive us and that we would see your, your commands as promises and that one day we would look and say never again. Amen, amen. I wasn't uh, planning on going there. But we got to go there. We got to go there. Ah, oh, wow. Yeah, right. Deuteronomy. Okay, moving right along here. Jesus overcomes where Adam fell. He overcomes where Israel fell. He is a man. He qualifies as our faithful high priest and savior. Friends, the victory that Jesus has here is what propels him into authority over the enemy in ministry. He comes right out of the gates out of here and he is casting out demons, which never happened in the Old Testament. There was no casting out devils. There is a authority over the enemy that Jesus has because of what he overcame internally. God wants to give you authority over the enemy in your test. That's why we should rejoice in some of our testings because if we overcome... We're going to have greater authority in areas of our lives over the enemy. And Jesus models this. Not only that, but Jesus inaugurates an entire new era. The kingdom of God now is advancing. And he de he's, he's proclaiming this. The, there's a totally new epoch. The days of the kingdom, the year of our Lord, are now here at hand. God is now beginning his recreation process. And so... It is a huge era shift. Everything hinged at this test, friends. All of history hinged at the test. Don't miss this next time you read it. Okay, I have a few. I have a few. Uh, <laughs> what can we learn from this? And I, I, uh, <laughs> I've got 12 points. I'm going to say them real fast. I'm so sorry. But <laughs> Carl, get off the stage. But no, I, I want you guys to hear this because, you know, a couple of these are going to like, a couple of these are going to be like, oh, I didn't know that. And if you're, if you're just new to following Jesus, I want to give you some of the ones that maybe 
seem obvious because um, when you're in testing, when you're in a wilderness, when you're in temptation, follow Jesus. Do what he did. He's our model, guys, okay? Two, be on your guard. We, gotta li we live in war zone time. We can email these out for you, maybe if you want to do in your small groups. Especially when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, be on your guard. Number three, remember who you are. It's, I believe that every temptation can be rooted down to an identity, negative value judgment. You're worthless. You're not valuable. The heart of temptation is identity, friends, and I can't go into it right now. Number four, ask, Father, what are you saying right now? What are you doing? I've been saying that all year. What are you doing, God? This is crazy. What are you saying? You know what he's saying? Seek me. Humble yourself. Seek me. And that's the next one. Number five, humble and seek yourself. We've got to do that still these, these days. We've got to humble ourselves. Number six, uh, meditate on the word. Eat the book. Isaiah or Ezekiel 3, eat the scroll. We've got to get in this book and we've got to get it into our spirits. We've got to eat it. It is food, Jesus said. Remember that? Number seven, speak the word out loud. You might not think about this. Jesus did. Speak it out loud. Say it out loud. We'll do this with my kids when they're having a, a, you know, a, a nightmares. Say this with me. God has not given me a spirit of fear. God has not given me a spirit of fear. But power, power, love, sound mind. Okay, did the fear go? No. Okay, let's say it again, you know. Number eight, ask others to pray for you. Number nine, command the devil to go. We don't, this is one maybe you don't think of. Devil, go. Jesus did that. Sometimes when we're praying with our kids, we'll just say, spirit of fear, go. Did it go? Yeah, it did go. Okay, good. You know, back to sleep. We're not going to have conversations, but just tell it to go. Tell the enemy to go. Uh, number 10, draw on Christ's victory. I, I don't have any time to talk about this. But Jesus lived a perfect life, and it's now credited to your account. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. That's crazy. He lived the perfect life so that it could be credited to you. You've got to draw on it. Christ is victorious. And so when we go through our test, we are, we are appropriating his victory. I wish I could talk more about that. Number 11, embrace a lifestyle of fasting and prayer. This is a key, I think, to, to appropriating. I think we gotta, we got to do what Jesus did. The fast was what strengthened Jesus. And so we need to do this. Uh, Lou Engel is this guy, if you've never heard of him, he's like, he has the ministry of fasting and prayer. Nobody wants to be called to this because he like fasts all the time and calls people to fast. He's been doing it for 40 years. Um, and he, uh, actually he's been doing it for much longer. He's, I think he's like 60 but he's, um, he's, he's leading the charge for the body of Christ to fast and pray and see revival in our day. And he says this. He says, before there ever was an original Jesus movement, there was an original Jesus fast. And right now, the globe is ripe for a new Jesus movement. And what's going to precede that is the church actually fasting and praying. And so I, I, wanna just, I just want to say that to you. Like, start embracing this. You know, start using those muscles. And you will see... You will see yourself have victory, I promise you. And lastly, don't give up before the breakthrough. Don't give up before the breakthrough. God always comes through. There's one more verse, and I just want to invite the, the worship team to come up here as we end. Sorry. Worship team, make your way up here, and you guys can start play, uh, playing. But uh, take a look at the last verse. This is a, verse 11. I used to just breeze by this. Don't miss this, friends. Then the devil left him, and behold, whenever you see the word behold, the author is saying, look, look, reader, look, do you see? Do you see it? Angels came. In other words, the father came. The angels came to feed him. God broke through. The father made it. He answered. And friends, I just want to encourage you. If you would just wait on the Lord, if you would just fight, the Father will show up. And when he shows up, it is so rewarding. And it makes you all the more like in love with him and able to trust him more. So why don't we just stand and let's just respond. Let's respond to him this morning, friends. 
pray with me? And you guys can start, you guys, why don't you start singing the chorus? Can you do that? Let's just sing that real quick. You can have yes, it all, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Every part of my yes, world. Just say yes to it this morning. Take this life and breathe yes. on. Take our lives, Lord. Breathe on it. This heart that is now yours. Yes, just give them your heart this morning. Give them your heart. All your failures, just give it to him and say, you can have it, Lord. You can have my heart. Every part of it. Every part of my world. Take my life, Lord. Yes. Take this life and breathe. Breathe on it, Lord. This heart is now. Father, we give, you, we give you our lives. We just surrender again in all of our struggles and failures and our weaknesses. Oh, the joy I found. We give it to you, Lord. Surrendering my crown at the feet of the kings who surrender. responding we have communion elements and we just want you to feel free to take those communion elements and just remember the bread of life of all humanity didn't make bread for himself but he gave himself for us to sustain us he is the bread of life for all humanity he could have made bread for himself but he didn't and he gave he gives it to you now to give you the wholeness that you need and the healing that you need and the wholeness that you've been longing for and he poured out his blood for you that you could be forgiven that you could enter into a new covenant with Him. That things can look different, that you could actually have victory over the enemy. So receive His forgiveness this morning. Respond to Him. So Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your broken body. We thank you for your poured out blood. And we respond to you now.